you very much for coming. Um, I want you to come on a journey with me and to be a time traveller. That's what I'm hoping you'll do over the next 15 minutes. And this is the question that I would like to pose to you, which is, what do you actually think the prevalence of bile, acid, diarrhoea is in the UK? Hands up those who think it's one in 100,000. Hands up those who think it's one in 1,000. Hands up those of you who think it's Friday afternoon. I don't care. I just, <laughs> I just want to go home now. I'll answer that question at the end for you. So, back to time travel. You, good sir, can you recognise somebody in this picture? Oh, that might be you, Professor Bardan. And for those of you who don't know, Prof Bardan is all things gastroenterology. He is the, the grandfather of everything that's happened here uh, and the happiness that we have in our department. He's our emeritus prof. I put him up there is because he was one of the earliest researchers in bile acid malabsorption. And this picture is a schematic diagram of how it works. Bile acids are made in the liver, stored in the gallbladder, you eat, out comes uh, the bile acids to help the digestive process, and then they are reabsorbed in the terminal ileum and it's a circular motion, okay? So that's well worth keeping in mind. When people tell me stuff like that, I immediately switch off. So the easy way to think of it is it's very liquid. Now, how, how do you test for bile acid diarrhea? This is a CCAT scan. So people are given bile acids that are radio labeled, and then seven days later, you see how much they're losing. And if they're losing a lot, they're not cycling it, but they're losing it, then they can have bile acid diarrhea. And these are the earliest descriptions. And the reason I've put this up is this was known about in the 60s. And at about the same time, this description was occurring in the literature about something called the spastic colon or the irritable colon or irritable bowel syndrome. And it's funny that one thing got traction and another thing got left behind. Time travelers don't always get things right. So we've talked a lot today about IBS. And I think this diagram summarizes it really, really well. But the question that I want to pose to you is why is it that none of our treatments are particularly effective for IBS? What is it about IBS? And what I want to suggest is that actually it's just a constellation of symptoms. Now, I have no doubts that some people fulfill these criteria perfectly, and many of the things that we've discussed are treatments or therapies that we can offer. But it was literally a collection of symptoms that was then baggaged up as the Rome criteria. Funny that medics never meet in Skegness, do they? They always meet in Rome or Geneva or someplace like that. Anyway, these are the, the criteria, and essentially that allows you to run drug studies if you can fit people into this. But I have a completely different view. And, and my view is that gastroenterologists have let this group of patients down, yeah? We're more than happy to shove a colonoscopy up somebody and then write a 36-year-old woman's a letter saying, great news, you don't have cancer. I don't care about your symptoms, take care. Have a look at the internet, bye, and discharge, okay? That is what we do. And I've always asked this question, which is in my head, what is IBS really? Honestly, what is it? And I think the question that I have felt is that there may be other things in there. And unfortunately, when you get into this sort of turf war, people have ideology. And ideology replaces science. As we can see, if you believe 350 million pounds is coming to the NHS, you might do something very stupid. So <laughs> ideology is a very strong thing. And actually, that is not science, that is religion. So let's go back as a time traveler. This is the first report of people who had IBS type symptoms in whom there was undiagnosed celiac disease. And when we were doing this 20 years ago, and it all came from a, a single patient who came with IBS type symptoms and told me that she thought she had celiac disease, and she was right. So when we ran this study and we were presenting it internationally, IBS researchers, IBS doctors would stand up, and I remember very clearly in the States, um, 
where, when it was question time, uh, a, a very well-known, world-famous IBS medic stood up and said, son, I've been doing IBS for a long time, and I ain't seen no goddamn celiac disease. And there was just silence, and I fell through the floor. There isn't really very much you can say to someone like that. But the reality was he was wrong. The international literature followed through. Everything changed, and it took about 10 years before NICE made that recommendation. So how do we square that circle? IBS, something within IBS. And I think the difference is what I would call IBS-type symptoms. People come to us with IBS-type symptoms, but there are other things lurking in that. And this brings me back to bile acid diarrhea. This is a review of the literature that was published a few years ago, and you can see that the suggestion is there might be quite a high prevalence within this group of patients of undiagnosed bile acid diarrhea. This systematic review was criticised because they said you didn't just deal with IBS, you took in chronic diarrhea, you have an acetane spike, you were pushing towards this being a condition that occurs. If you look at the literature in black, these are all retrospective studies looking at the prevalence, using the CCAT scan that I showed you earlier, looking at the prevalence of bile acid diarrhea within patients who have IBS-type symptoms. And again, because it's retrospective studies, everyone said, but why did you test that patient? What made you test that individual? What was it about that patient that made you actually go and do a CCAT? I'm sure it can't be as common as you think. Which led to Imran seeing 100 consecutive patients along with colleagues in Leeds, so Sheffield and Leeds, a, a dual centre study where literally consecutive patients who fulfilled a Rome criteria for IBS were tested with a CCAT. And you can see here that the prevalence was almost 25%. So that's staggering. One in four people who have IBS diarrhoea predominant are likely to have bile acid diarrhoea. And that message was not just with us. At the same time, a Swedish group came up with a very similar study with very similar prevalences. And one of the interesting things about their findings was they looked at all types of IBS. And, and it's harder, I find that harder to understand because I think of it as predominantly causing, causing diarrhea. But I think the main message is it's out there and it's out there at a very high prevalence. And most people don't know this. So, let me give you an alternative view of IBS-type symptoms. There are many conditions hidden within. And if you can remove these conditions, that IBS bubble becomes smaller, and then you really are left with IBS, and then those dietary therapies really will work, and other things, and your patient will benefit as a result of that transaction. So, it still hasn't quite gained credulence. Here's a, a, a report of a patient from the mail. And the thing that I want to highlight to you is what this lady describes, her own journey. It's a long wait. She saw a lot of doctors. Nobody thought to test her. These were the type of problems that she was living with. And having that diagnosis completely changed her life. And yet, the medical community are not testing for bile acid diarrhea. This is a survey of gastroenterologists, and it's basically saying to them, how often, when you see somebody with IBS-type symptoms, would you actually consider doing a CCAT scan? And the answer, as you can see, was hardly at all. So this is, in, to me, it's incredible. It, it, it's there, the literature's there supporting it, but we're all far too busy doing a colonoscopy and a letter of discharge. If you look at the guidelines, and here I've drawn a comparison. As you can see, okay, this is not IBS, but this is chronic diarrhea. Right up on top of working through this algorithm, you would do a blood test for celiac disease, as you would do for IBS. But way down at the bottom comes CCAT, if the patient manages to get that far in the system. And the prevalence of celiac disease, as you know, is one in a hundred. Now, let's just think, roughly speaking, IBS affects 5% of the population. So if I then said to you that a quarter of people have got bile acid diarrhea within that, then actually bile acid diarrhea is probably 1% of the general population, no different to celiac disease. 
This you may have seen. This is a summary of the different types. It's a historical categorization. And what it's done is listed out different things that interfere with that enterohepatic circulation that I saw, showed you at the beginning. So for example, if you had Crohn's disease and you had a right hemicolectomy, then you're less likely to reabsorb uh, your bile acids and you're very likely to have bile acid diarrhea as a consequence of that surgery. And the interesting thing about this his historical categorization is that actually, it calls type 2 idiopathic, and in fact, that is the largest group, probably 1%, 1 in 100. Here, I've listed all the conditions where I think you as clinicians, if you're seeing somebody, quite aside from the background population of 1%, maybe these are things to trigger you. Chronic diarrhea, had a cholecystectomy, some of these inflammatory bowel disease conditions which directly interfere with enterohepatic circulation. And last of all, late effects cancer patients, because actually radiotherapy, although you think of it as targeted, it's not. And often these individuals will have uh, leftover residual bile acid dysfunction. So I've conducted a little experiment and what I did was I put in the two terms. What happens if I go for bile acid diarrhea? What happens if I put in celiac disease? And that's the difference. There is virtually no pub publication stream. So I would summarize by saying, if you look at celiac disease and you have seen it in your profession, the world has changed so much for the last two decades for these patients. But if you look at bile acid diarrhea, there is no machinery behind it. And in answer to your question, it's 1% of the population. Thank you very much.